the Roxy was very much uh, influenced by electronic music, by soul music, and just all the normal pop music and rock music of Elvis. And I always find that if I go into a shop somewhere and I can just hear a bit of the accent and they say, Uf, usted es suramericana. Almost always it's like, Colombiana. Okay, you know, ah, ma madre colombiana. Okay, here, we, here we've got a picture of the paddle steamer uh, on the uh, Rio Magdalena uh, at Girardo. Uh, and this is the, uh, the, the kind of uh, boat that my grandfather used to be the captain of and went from Barranquilla all the way up to the foothills of the Andes, which is, of course, the way the conquistadors got into uh, South America and then plundered the poor Indians of all their emeralds and gold and stuff up this river. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we were talking about the disenfranchised community in Latin America and London and your views on uh, how, how they've evolved here, how, how they <coughs> operate here. Well, it does always amaze me when I see any statistics about how many Latinos, South Americans there are living in London. Mm. I'm always staggered by the enormous number. There are lots of restaurants. There are different kind of bands with, and, and uh, there's obviously all the, the salsa dancing. It's very popular and stuff. I always find that if I go into a shop somewhere and I can just hear a bit of the accent, uh, and I, I mean, they say, usted suramericana. Almost always it's like, colombiana. <laughs> okay, you know, ah, ma madre colombiana, etc. You know, so, and it's, my face lights up. You know, I, it's, it's a joy to know that there's lots of people from South America here. And uh, in all different shapes and sizes and doing all kinds of different yeah, jobs. Yeah. The first wave of, of Latinos came over really in, in, in numbers in the 70s, mm. uh, kind of late 70s, early 80s. Mm. Uh, so it's about 30 years, and that for the second generation, and now, you know, they've, they've, they've put themselves through education and yes. now starting to make inroads. So I also think it, it'll take a little bit of time, but, but yeah. we're, we're getting there. Uh, but, but on your point about, um, you know, Latinos coming together, I think that's what made or makes Carnaval del Pueblo so special. Um, mm. As a young Latino growing up in London, it was one of the very few occasions where my culture was, was on show for very positive reasons. Yeah. And I could say to my British friends, let's go to this wonderful event and you're gonna see, you're gonna hear about my music, you're gonna see my food, you're gonna, you're gonna see the performances. And it was a really proud time for me. Um, Carnaval del Pueblo it, it holds within London, I think, uh, a really pivotal um, uh, role yeah. in Latin American culture. Mm. It very much is a social enterprise and it's, it's kind of community engagement. It's far more than just yeah. putting on a show. Yes. It's it's all of the, the kind of grassroots, mm. it's the, the galvanizing, it's bringing all these people together, yes. it's creating job opportunities. It's, Absolutely. You know, yeah, it, yeah. it was always in the summer, yeah. so and it was in, in August time. August time, invariably, I guess when the kids were growing up, I'd be away yeah. on holiday yeah. and stuff like that. So, but I have read, I read about it, mm. and I th every time I read about it, I said, "Oh wow, that sounds fantastic!" Damn, missed yeah. that again. Yeah. Um, but the whole idea of it is brilliant, yeah. and it should be uh, revived. And as you know, you were saying to me, you know, this whole regeneration of the Elephant yes. and Castle area, what a perfect opportunity. Yes to actually revive it and make that the center, just as the Nautical Carnival is over in this area, if that's where the, a lot of Latinos are living, and it has that little bit of a history yeah. uh, in that area, well, it's a perfect fit, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So, so you, you've been very, very busy in your career. Um, tell us a little bit about um, your Latin American roots, about your, and how that, okay. that uh, influenced your music. I was born to a British father and a Colombian mother. My mother came from Barranquilla. My father went out to work there for the British Council in 1935. <clears throat> and my mother was called Magdalena Manzanera. And I use her name as my stage name, if you like. Right. They would then went to live in Argentina. My brother was born in Argentina. 
then they, they moved back to England in 1949, and I was born in 1951 here. And then in 1957, he was transferred to Havana, to Cuba. And he, by that stage, he was working for an airline company called BOAC, which is now British Airways. Right. And they were just opening up routes all around the world uh, for the arrival of jets everywhere, because they just invented you know, the, in the middle 50s jet. So I moved there, I went to a Cuban school learned Spanish within three months and then after the revolution we had to leave because all foreigners had to leave uh, right. about six months after the revolution so spent a time with gun fights and all sorts of battles between our house because we lived uh, in front of the General Tavernilla who was the head of the uh, Air Force I think or Batista the dictator so there's gun battles from our garden to his house and it's quite scary although when you're seven or eight you know it's you don't really realize that and then we had to leave we went to Hawaii briefly and then to Venezuela to Caracas and my father was in charge of Venezuela Colombia and the West Indies for British Airways I was backwards and forwards uh, between uh, Venezuela and the UK till I was 15, till 1965, when my father died in Venezuela. And then my mother came back to live full time and I came back to live full time. In London? In London, yeah. But when I was in uh, Havana, my mother started having guitar lessons. Being an inquisitive seven or eight year old, I wanted to get my hands on that thing, that guitar. And uh, so she taught me, started teaching me to play uh, accompaniment, just chords and, and picking out and all the famous songs that uh, we all, all Latinos know and are sung in every Latino restaurant everywhere in the world. And then at that time, you know, I got taken to the Tropicana Club and, you know, all the famous people who then later bec became famous in the Buena Vista Social Club were at their prime in 1957, wow, that, 58 that in Havana all those influences were coming into me and then a little bit of music in Hawaii and then in Venezuela and then I used to go over to Bogota, Girardot, Medellin, Cali and lots of, I have lots of family, I have 60 cousins in Colombia As you do That's when one, one does <laughs> Big family yeah. yeah They were all mad on music and they would play me boleros they would play me, uh, the girls would play me manzanero Armando Manzanero, yeah. they love the romantic songs. My cousins had been to New York and they could play jazz piano and and they, in Girardo, they bought me a tiple, and started teaching me how to play tiple, and in Venezuela, the cuatro. And so uh, I was into sort of stringed instruments and things. Yes. Yes. And then I met a, a Venezuelan friend of mine, the same age, and we saw these American college kids who would come over in their long vacations and play electric guitars and play rock and roll and we could see that all the girls were looking at them <laughs> I said we got to get elect yeah. we got to get tooled yeah. up with electric guitars there's something in this I bought a guitar for a British boy who, who was at boarding school in the UK uh, he used to come on holidays and he showed me a few Chuck Berry riffs and then I right. that's when I started getting into rock and roll and that's interesting that, that so you, you so the, you got into the electrics through the uh, kind of rhythm and blues and or rock and roll which when chuck i berry. to my untrained yeah. chuck berry yeah i mean i'm not a musician i'm an architect but when i i'm when mm. i listen to rock and roll i can hear a lot of latino influences mm. or beats in there and i wonder whether that's the african the African influence, but that's interesting. That well, yeah, that's I mean, that's what you, you first know, got into coming uh, from such a strong heritage, Latino heritage. There was always this really groovy, sexy, rhythmic music yeah. that had evolved, and they didn't need this sort of wimpy pop music that was yeah. coming out of with very light beats and things. You couldn't really dance to it properly. But I was listening on the World Service to the UK, and I was hearing all this music, and I begged my parents to send me to boarding school in England. So when I was 10, yeah, yeah. I came to Dulwich College yeah. in South London. 
and I used to go home every holiday because my father worked for airline and I had free flights. So, I, so half my time was in Venezuela and half my time was in the UK. So I really became this sort of split personality of a British person and a South American person. I, I begged to go to Dulwich College when I was 10 and I was sent as a boarder and I was there. I arrived in September 1960 and I left in December 1969. So I was there for the whole of the 60s. The first half I was going back was to South America and my father died and then I was based in Clapham near Brixton. And, uh, but I was still a boarder. Through being at school, I met a lot of uh, young guys who were trying to be musicians and then we helped each other. So with electric guitar playing, that's uh, what happened. The school, official school music teacher, uh, totally looked down on us, <laughs> completely. But having said that, when my father died, they paid for, completely for all my education. I didn't right. have to pay anything for like, from the age of 15 to 19. Right. Just a wonderful uh, fund for people in difficult situations. And when I was at Dulwich, even though it's a, a famous British public school, there was this thing that happened called the Dulwich Experiment, and where the local councils, uh, when you took the 11 plus, would pay for your education. Uh, it doesn't matter from which socio-economic background you came from. So there was a lot of famous people came out of Dulwich in the 60s who came from relatively poor families. It was paid for by the GLC, by Bromley, by Kent, uh, and uh, one of them, of these people became governor of the Bank of England. Uh, Eddie George, his name was. And um, there were all sorts of people, heads of BBC New, Newsnight, and uh, also very famous Stuart Purvis, his name was. Um, and, th and that's how I met. We met all sorts of people. During that period, you know, I met uh, through a friend of mine, uh, one musician who has always been a friend uh, called Robert Wyatt, and he does his albums here still. There were two famous bands in the middle of the 60s, British bands, one was called Soft Machine and one was called Pink Floyd. I'd met Robert Wyatt when I was 16 through my friend Bill and then I met David Gilmore when I was 16 as well through my brother. So you know him in quite a long time. Yeah, because um, my mo I said to my mother, I want to be a professional musician and if my father died and everything, she said, oh, she was very worried at being in little Colombian lady from Barranquilla, <laughs> rock and roll, what the... And my brother said, who was actually at Cambridge at the time, my brother said, I know this guy, he's just become a professional musician, let's go and ask him what you have to do to become a professional musician. So we went and had lunch with him, he'd just joined Pink Floyd, right. and uh, he was just about to go into Abbey Road to record the first Pink Floyd album that he played on, Source of of Secrets, with Sid Barrett was on it as well. And he, he can't remember what he said to me. But he said, it must have been good, because five years later, you got into Roxy Music. <laughs> okay. Phil, could you tell us a little bit about your family? So you, we've heard about your mother, um, children. Could you tell us a little bit more about your immediate family? I have three children, three stepchildren. They're dotted all over the world at this very moment. Um, and uh, But basically, you know, I had very normal sort of you know just like it's brought up all over the world <laughs> that's not so normal I uh, went to school you know, joined a band got married had children got divorced got married again um, and uh, that's it in a nutshell really I yeah. mean you know <laughs> I found as, as, a, as a Latino uh, Londoner growing up like you bicultural um, the, the the advent of the internet changed a lot of things. Oh, correct, um, yeah, growing up, mm. you know, up until pre-internet, communication with Colombia was a big deal. You know, telephone calls were hugely expensive and very difficult. Call, yes, and very difficult. Yes, um, there was you know it was letters. I remember letters. receiving letters with yeah. those with the old air by air mail, blue and white. Absolutely, and, yeah. And Got that was a real event in our house when. You know, every six months we'd receive a letter from Colombia. Yeah. Um, but then the internet came and the world shrunk. Mm. You know, all of a sudden, yeah. we could communicate through emails. 
um, you know, the internet 2.0, Skype. Um, so, and then I, that's when for me, uh, Latin America didn't seem so far away for Europe, but it, it you know, it became no. viable as, as you a, know, totally. Um, I mean, I have uh, my 84 year old uh, uncle rings me on FaceTime <laughs> virtually every week from Bogota. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> Which is, is, it's very futurist, you know, science fiction y, really, yeah. for someone, yeah, who used to get letters, these, yeah. the letters that you talk about, which yeah. were really long and told you all what was happening to all the cousins and, yeah, yeah. and, and I mean, all my, over uh, Colombia. Sim similarly, my, my children, who are one and four, mm. have a, a very strong relationship mm. with their grandmother in Colombia and their aunts and uncles mm. um, and it's through Skype yeah you know in, in my day that it was unthinkable it was almost when when we moved here um, I was five and it was almost saying goodbye mm. um, and we yeah. you know it was almost that it was yes. that far away and it was the, it was that difficult to establish a contact it was it, it was a very traumatic thing actually saying goodbye and yes. it was understood that you're not going to see your yes. grandparents Yes, but my children have a very different experience. They 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 talk to their grandmother every weekend. Yeah, and to them, their grandmother is very, it's a very tacit, mm. uh, very loose, um, very lucid. But she she's very much involved in their lives. Yeah. through through the internet. Yeah, which is lovely. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Roxy music. Mm. Do you mind if we talk a little no. bit about Roxy yeah. music? How how did the Latin American heritage, which I have to say, it sounds incredible. You know, mm. Colombia, Cuba, Argentina. Venezuela, the and and you know the the mm. massive range of music that you'd have mm. been picking up, um, and it really was an introduction into music. Mm. How did how did those influences uh, then find their way, if at all, <coughs> into, into Roxy music? Very obliquely, and uh, and um, you know Roxy was very much uh, influenced by electronic music, by soul music, and by. Um, systems music uh, and just all the normal pop music and rock music of Elvis and the Beatles and all those kind of yeah. things um, I guess the only way my sense of rhythm always wants things to be in uh, a faster beat and or a faster uh, metric so I would um, if Roxy were playing something uh, in 4-4 this is to get to I'll be playing maybe triplets against the 4-4 with echoes and things like that because I wanted it to be more movido yeah and so I was always like pushing to be ahead in front of the beat so it's a very specialized thing but within the context of what we were doing you know my love of cumbia and things like that uh, would come out in the rhythmic patterns I think that I tried to put in but I, I had to do it by sort of subterfuge really but once I started doing solo albums which was in like in 1975 I could then uh, bring in much more overt Latin types of uh, percussion and, and things like that into yeah. my solo stuff a lot. so it was really when when you started your solo recordings that that then you had the freedom yes. Yeah, I, I guess I, I, I could do whatever I wanted to do and experiment. I, mean, I, I think Kyojo is a wonderful track. Yeah. Um, I listened to it the other day mm. and it was quite cathartic for me. Mm. Like I say, growing up as bicultural as a, as a Colombian Latino mm. in London, um, the, hearing this record that was clearly of Latin American origin, mm. but, but um, uh, expressed through rock, an electric guitar was actually a really beautiful thing mm. um, and and it was a it's just a, such a wonderful thing after Roxy sort of finished its first big phase which was about 1983 or something yeah. you know and I uh, by that stage I had a studio out in the country and I suddenly thought I've never done anything that actually focuses in on my background my Latino background so I did an album called Southern Cross, and it was literally a play on words. It was a cross between South American music and Latin music, and it's also obviously an astrological thing. It was called Southern Cross. I specifically went out to try and find some Latino musicians in London. Right. How did that go? Uh, that was good. I, I, I came across uh, Chucho Merchan, 
but I met the, all these people at the same time and we put together a band called Orquesta Luna and we had a logo and, everything. and we, actually we went and played in Ibiza wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> about uh, god there was about 20 people or something it was really, I had this idea to concentrate on, on Latino thing well, on that particular album I which was the same time as Avalon the Roxy album it was a solo album so I did use the T play on the track Criollo and, and then I had Rimo de los Angeles and I had a few other little dabbles into Latino stuff but Southern Cross was more like songs right. and subject matter some of it was about Cuba some of it was about we had a uh, cumbia the, the, the big change occurred when the Buena Vista Social Club yes. became a huge hit yes. And that, even though, you know, I'd been working with people uh, uh, from South America producing albums, and, and uh, in Spain and South America, uh, it was only when uh, Peter Gabriel uh, and uh, Buena Vista embraced so-called world music that yeah. it became uh, disseminated. Yes. Uh, through uh, the media and so people started to become aware of music from not only from South America but from all it's interesting that it's a film to do that isn't it I mean now well the film and the album that marked uh, uh, an opening up uh, because of some famous people and because that was so good yes. and it was such an interesting story so I continued my uh and I did an album Boleros with a Peruvian lady, wow. Tania Liberta, which uh, we did some of it here, we did some of it in Mexico City. So there was a lot of uh, uh, involvement with Latinos and Latino musicians, both in the UK and in, and, and in the in So you've, you've really been a part of the Latin American music scene for, for a long time. What are the changes you, you've noticed in, in the London Latino music scene? Well, I've been to a few sort of seminars and things where, and I've always on the lookout for um, young, uh, second generation Latinos actually. Right. And um, we have uh, on the, the albums I do with Lucho, that says Cor Coroncho, and now we have Coroncho 2. Um, uh, we tend to uh, find musicians from London who are Latinos and come and we get them in here to play on stuff. So we, have, we also needed some brass putting on and we sent it to our musician friends in Bogota and they did it in Bogota and sent it back. That's a modern way. Wow. And we have a, a great rapper, uh, Pernet, uh, on it as well. And we have Andrea Echeverria from uh, Cheveri from Atelso Palados on it. It is really, you know, going backwards and forwards between yeah. South America and here, and that, and it's really fusing <coughs> together. And, and in the Coroncho album, we actually look at, at uh, a lot of issues to do with, from the, the perspective of two Colombians, so half Colombian and Lucho does it, full Colombian, living in London, in a light-hearted way, yeah. as a lot of the songs. They're quite funny, some of them. But to do with uh, 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 machismo and uh, the, the the way that certain countries don't get on with other countries, and we have a song called uh, Arepa, yeah. which is about who invented the arepa, whether it was the Colombians or the Venezuelans. <laughs> and there's a big fight <laughs> in the song, and we have sampled, you know, yeah. Chavez when he did his TV and the, uh, Good Morning, Mr. President. You've been actually applying the principles that Canal del Pueblo apply, you know, in terms of developing young um, mm. Latin American arts and, and perform performing arts, mm. and then giving them a stage. Mm. Um, would you like to one day perhaps perform at Canal del Pueblo? Absolutely. The, the, the thing is, um, it's always down, as we, any performance is down to cost. I mean, just rehearsing, even if you say, well, yeah, we'll play for free. It's never, there is a cost because you have to get all the musicians. It's not fair on them not to be paid. You have to rehearse with them to put on a good show. Yeah. 
So to put on something just for one night is always like incredibly expensive. And that is the problem. I, I know having done, you know, similar, not a similar thing, but been involved with something in Italy yes. this summer in uh, Melpignano, the night of the tarantula, La Notte de la Taranta, which is very cultural. And most of the music, I had to help provide the repertoire for the four hour concert, uh, which mixed uh, traditional stuff with modern beats and electronics and all sorts of stuff. That there's an enormous amount of work. That took like nine months. So that's you as a musician, hmm. but you're also a hugely accomplished record producer. Yes, I suppose I am. <laughs> yes, I mean... The, the yes, I have actually produced, I think, over 60 albums. Wow. Actually. Um, a lot is in Spanish, and but obviously just recently with David Gilmour and Pink Floyd, Pink Floyd in the yeah, last yes. year. Um, been lucky to have two number one albums in one year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> it strikes me visiting your 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 home, your uh, studio. Mm. You are very much interested in the craft of things, the making of things, whether it's music, whether it's furniture, whether it's the space you're in. Um, it's it's almost like a to total way of uh, art as a lifestyle, or the creation of the making of art as a lifestyle. I think everybody, you know, has a desire to create a nice environment for themselves mm. and it's just a series of choices do i like this do i like that do i like that color do i like this color and it's the same with record producing do i like this riff or do i like this riff do i like that note do i prefer that note do i like that harmony it's just answering a series of questions now the palette that you draw from is made from your experiences in life and I guess growing up as I did um, with this duality, uh, British and South American, and living in South America and in England, and then traveling and working uh, all over uh, the world means that I've seen a lot and I've listened to all different kinds of music. So I have a big palette to draw on. Yes of the things that I love whether it's music or visual arts as a musician as, as a musician an artist. it means there's, there's no there's never been any job security or anything like that so you know there have been some hairy moments but I've just stuck to the core values of things that uh, that I enjoy music and I thought that would get me through life I, th I actually think really Colombia is underrated time. musically as, as a force. In terms and young, of, the young yeah. uh, people, what they're doing is just extraordinary. I mean, uh, you know, Andres, who works here, has shown me stuff. Uh, and it's just ridiculously good. But when you see and hear these musicians and you think they're so good, yet maybe they're, they're not earning a fraction of what somebody in America or or in the mm, mm. Uh, probably American yeah. not the UK because that's a bit difficult here for people as well it's um, a whole other load of work that's got to be done and and as a recording artist you've obviously the Roxy music mm. the work you did with them you've been in, you've been involved in some legendary work mm. you know love is the drug is such a, a the, you know, a and Roxy has some good wonderful good tunes. wonderful um, <laughs> Also, take a chance with me. You know, yeah. I've recently rediscovered Avalon. Okay. And take a chance with me is right at the top of my most played on Spotify at the moment. But I pick on those two uh, the, from the Roxy mm. era mm. because the guitar is so mm. uh, eminent in those mm. two tracks, and, and you know, especially with "Take a Chance with Me," it yes. makes the song. Yeah, take a you chance. Know, um, with me. It's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's clear in, in that mm. song that it, mm. it was very much driven by the guitar and then Brian Ferry's vocals. Mm kind of melancholy in the romance yeah uh, this other layer this other texture to, yeah. to the song um and more recently you know, you know kanye west jay-z yeah no, no church you know, in the like world no church in the world sampling was, your your k-scope yeah so how did that come about that uh you know that's the kind of random thing 
th that I say, you know, serendipity, things just happen. You know, mm -hmm. I'd recorded that album, K Scope, in 1976, I think. Cool. Right. And that was the first track on that. A, uh, a rapper called 88 Keys in New York, who's a friend of Kenya West, bizarrely had found it in a record shop on vinyl <laughs> and was looking for things to sample and sampled my guitar. Yeah. And uh, he was passing through uh, New York uh, and rang up Kenya and he was doing the album with Jay-Z in a hotel. And, and they said to him, why don't you pop round? So he popped round and they said, have you got any beats, man? And he said, no, no, I haven't got time because I'm going to see my wife. And I, I, I know this because he said this online. They said, oh, come on, play us something. So he played him 13 different things. And the one that they chose was mm -hmm. my guitar. <laughs> and they wrote a song around it. And it was the last thing they did on the album called Watch the Throne. And because yeah. invariably, if it's the last thing you do, you're most excited about it. Right. It's fresh. And within and a they week, they were quite they, true to your riff, weren't they? Yeah, Maybe those rap the guys take it yeah. and they all augment it or change. Yes, they, they were quite true to your riff. Yeah, they just sampled it. They built the song around it. Yeah, and then I was in a car traveling around here with my son one day. I was probably on the way to Sainsbury's or something, do some shopping, and the phone went, and it was New York, and they said, "Oh, uh, yeah, Jay Z and Kanye West. Uh, we can't send it to you. It's top secret, but uh, we'll play it to you down the phone." I said, no, I think you made a mistake. I don't think it's me. Because they were always getting my name, Manzanera, mixed, mixed up with Ray Manzarek from The uh -huh. Doors. I, th I think you got a mistake. It's probably Ray Manzarek. He said, no, no, it's you. I said, I don't think so. So play it to me. And I put it on the speakerphone. I said to my son, record it on your phone. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, we'll come back here and we'll do a sort of remix and send it back to them just to laugh, to prove that you can't keep anything, you know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they played it, and I said, "Yeah, actually, that is me. Great, thanks. Bye." I thought, and I said, we drove off, and I thought, "Oh, that's probably quite big, isn't it?" And he said, Charlie said, "Yeah, probably." And I said, "Oh, well, <laughs> perhaps I've got to ring somebody and ask if they know. Probably need my permission or something." So anyway, you yeah, know, just I, I rang the people here, the publisher and the record company, who were actually own the copyright in it. And they said, oh yeah, we know about it. We're negotiating a deal. And I said, well, that's fantastic, but you could have told me. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it'd be nice to know. Yeah, I'm, but you know, I'm not going to stop it. It's fantastic, but um, and they negotiated a fantastic deal. And what's great and honourable about those guys is that they don't just rip stuff off. Yeah. You know, that they acknowledge who it's from. Yeah, and you get a credit, and you get. Yeah. I think I get more than they do. I've always admired that about hip hop and yeah. you know, the early the early guys. They they talk about. Yeah. I mean, the, the birth of hip hop was really mm. uh, the the New York guys. Yeah. It's because they didn't have their own recording studio, yeah. so they had to recycle. Yes. They had to get creative. Yeah. They had to get resourceful. That's right. They but they're also the really respectful of the source material. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's really nice in hip hop that that those principles have remained. It is really. It won a Grammy and and all, and it's been used mm -hmm. in films yeah. and and yeah. in ads and so I'm eternally grateful to them. So it's also a really lovely nod back to. It is. You know, I, I thought it was a bit cheeky to yeah. send it back to them, re-recorded. What did they think of it? I don't know, because I actually edited. I got rid of some bits. In fact, I got rid of their rapping bits. Yeah. And <laughs> because I thought no one can compete with that, so. Uh, I'll take the bits, in fact, one bit that was Frank Ocean came up with and one bit that um, a guy called The Dream did. And I took those bits and expanded it. Yeah. And so changed it. So I didn't obviously want to just do the same thing. It just made yeah. me laugh to think that I was redoing it and then what they would think yeah. when they heard it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I've got no idea. I have to say it's it's inspiring and, and, and I'm full of admiration that you're an ambassador for Latin American culture. That, that well, the, the, I also, you know, as I said before, you know, the, the Children of the Andes, which is now called Children Change Colombia, I'm very much involved with trying to help uh, children in Colombia mm. through uh, events that raise money. And Fernando Montaño is the chairman if you mm. like and 
I do things with him and through music we try and uh, help so that and that is my main charity yeah, uh, yeah. and so you know I have uh, a feel that th with music and focusing on Colombia is where I can do my little bit yeah. you know and that's my main uh, thing at the moment yeah but that I mean that's now that you've, you've been doing it throughout your career I've been doing all sorts of yeah, yeah, different, yeah. different that's what things. I find you know hugely yeah. inspiring and, yeah. and admirable you know, so thank Great. you thank, thank you, you.